Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This week, I chose an episode of Quiet Please entitled Beezer's Cellar. Quiet Please was the brainchild of radio and screenwriter Willis Cooper, creator of another famous radio series you might have heard of, Lights Out. Quiet Please debuted on the Mutual Broadcasting Network on June 8, 1947. In September 1948, the series switched to ABC and remained there until its final broadcast on June 25, 1949. In total, 106 episodes were made, every one of them written by Willis Cooper. Quiet Please is often categorized as horror, probably due to Cooper's roots in the genre. But as the author of a May 1949 article from Writer's Digest points out, there's no formula or pattern to Quiet Please other than it is always narrated in the first person by Ernest Chappell and has an eerie, slow-paced mood. Sometimes it's macabre, sometimes hilarious, but always entertaining. The same article reported that ABC received more listener requests for copies of Quiet Please scripts than for any other show. Like most of the surviving Quiet Please episodes, Beezer's Cellar suffers from sound issues. There is a loud recurring scratch throughout the episode, but we hope Cooper's imagination as a writer combined with Chappell's engrossing performance will make you forget such distractions and enjoy the series Harlan Ellison called one of the finest and most effective programs in the history of radio. And now, Beezer's Cellar from Quiet Please, originally broadcast October 10th, 1948. It's late at night. And a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting Company presents Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for today is called Beezer's Cellar. I looked at Marlena. Marlena looked at me when we heard this old guy talking about Beezer's Cellar. Get a load of this, Marlena, I said. Cup of French fry and eat it very quiet while we listen to the old guy. He was sounding off to another old guy. And the other old guy couldn't get a word in edgeways. So this here Beezer, they always called him Six Fingers Beezer, see, on account of he had six fingers on each hand. He never did build his house. He got the cellar dug, and then he up and hung himself in it. Well, I don't know why rightly, but... Uh, there was some talk about the cellar being dug into a cursed ground. Well, I want to tell you, there's been mighty odd doings up there, I, right, George? Up at Beezer Cellar? What? Well, fires and lights at night. And don't you tell me Foxfire. I've seen Foxfire, and I know it when I see it. And this year ain't Foxfire. Hmm? Sixty-odd years ago. And moans and hooting and hollering all over the place at night. And trees are waving their branches when they ain't no wind. No, sir, that's a real deserted place. You couldn't get me up there with a ten-foot pole. That there place is haunted, sonny. I just want another look there. No, sir. Ghosts and spirits and crawling things that hoot and holler. 
They ain't in my line. You no. getting that, Marlena? Gosh, no. Ain't been up there since I was a kid in short pants. A click of us went up there one afternoon in the fall, and we thought we seen a skeleton laying down there on the floor of the cellar, and we cut and run. Never stopped till we got to the C and A tracks. Yes, sir, Sonny. Uh, thank you for the root beer. That there is a place to shun, and by golly, people shun it. Well, hey, it's right out past the cemetery, where you turn off to the strict Fadden Road. But it'd take quite a lot of finding. About three miles east, there's a big elm tree that was struck by like... Come on, Marlena, I said. I we sort of drifted out of the place. The, the car was parked up under a big tree by the side of the road. Pete was sitting there with a P-38 pistol he brought back from the war. With his feet on the suitcase with the $82,000. We stopped to count it on the side street in Wilmington on the way down from Chicago. We watched the state cops go on past us down 66. Then we switched the license plates and jogged on after him. Pete wasn't taking any chances. He had the snoot of that P-38 in our faces the minute we walked up. You uh, want to make some kind of noise or something? I might not let you have it. Put the gun away for a minute and move over. Get in, Marlene. Did you bring me a sandwich? Barbecued pork, are they? Uh, I could eat it raw. What's cooking? Stanley's got an idea. What now? You're scared of ghosts, Pete. I ain't scared of anything. Well, that's good. Well, what's this about ghosts? We might run into a couple of them where we're going. An old man with six fingers on each hand. Oh, a cop? He hanged himself 60 years ago. What is all this double talk? Quit hollering and eat your sandwich. Listen, what are you figuring on? I found a place to leave the bag with the money for a while. While things cool off. Leave the bag? What'd you think I was going to do? In that cellar? What cellar? Stanley, are you crazy? Listen, how'd you like to let me in on this, huh? Listen, this is a haunted Please. cellar, see? The old man says nobody ever goes there. They're scared to go there. So am I. Oh, can up, Marlena. There ain't anything to be scared of. Only ghosts. Well, you can always go riding around the countryside if you want to ask some hick cop to take us. Yeah. It's always the way with you amateurs. I'm no amateur. I shot the guys, didn't I? Who told you to shoot? Who told you which ones to shoot? Well... You're beefing about it. I didn't say anything. Well, I wished I'd never got into this. For a nice chunk of $82,000, you wish that. Well, but do we have to do it this way, Stanley? You think of a better way? Where is this place? A few miles from here. What are we waiting for? That's my boy. Oh, we won't have to stay around there long, will we, Stanley? Why, listen, baby, you think I'd go there at all if I didn't have a hot suitcase to take care of? Leave right away. I will. <laughs> we all will. Whether old Six Finger shows up to scare us or not. <laughs> Don't, Stanley. Which way, Stan? Well, the old fellow said something about a road. Six Fadden Road. Well, well, look now, but the reason I was asking is there's a motorcycle coming down the road back there. <laughs> Where? I was just kind of interested in our next move. Not that I haven't got ideas of my own. Now put that gun away. I was only going to ask him a question. But he didn't have to ask him a question. Marlena stepped out of the car, and she walked right up to the man in the blue suit, and she said, How do I get to Sreek Faden Road, officer? Now the officer told her, just as polite as the head waiter. <laughs> He'd have been awful surprised if he'd known what was pointing at him while he was being so nice to the cute little redhead. Eh, what do you don't know won't hurt him, I always say. And we relaxed. Well, so we found the road all right. We drove along slow, little old Model A Ford with Indiana license plates. And we were pretty quiet. I don't know what Pete was thinking about in Marlena, but I know what I was thinking about. Trees hanging low over the road. Trees that moved their branches when there wasn't any wind. And lights in the night that wasn't Foxfire. Uh, whatever Fox 
Fox fire is. And pretty soon there was a great big old elm tree alongside the road, and it looked as if it had been struck by lightning. So we stopped. And then there wasn't any trees waving their branches or any funny noises. But we found Beezer's cellar. I wish we hadn't. There was the elm tree that was struck by lightning. And there was a fence that we busted down. There was a kind of path. Oh, it had been a path once. And it was all I could do in the dark to bust my way through the underbrush with a flashlight. <laughs> and Marlena and Pete waiting in the car ready to go into a smooching act if an inquisitive cop pulled up. <laughs> smooching. With a hiney pistol aimed under his arm over the side of the car. It was a lot easier getting the $82,000 than it was crawling through the bushes looking for Beezer's cellar. I pretty near fell into it. It didn't smell very good. There was water in spots in the bottom. Then it looked haunted enough. I kind of felt my back hair coming up, but I said, Yeah, well, it's better than one of these little iron rooms they got down in Stateville. And I went back after Pete and Marlena. We run the car off the road, hoping nobody would see it. We lugged the suitcase back through the underbrush. I jumped down. Pete and Marlena climbed down after me. Good deal, huh? Looks haunted, all right. I don't like this, Stanley. Well, let's stash the bag and get out of here. How are you going to do it? We'll dig a hole, jerk, and bury it. What with? Well, didn't you... Oh, Fred. Oh, wait a minute, Stanley. I see something over there against the wall. Flash the light. I thought I saw it when I climbed down. Huh. A shovel. Huh. Ain't that convenient. Maybe the ghosts left it here. Cut that out. <laughs> Scare you, kid? Well, cut it out. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Marlena. Uh, hold the light, Pete. Uh, no, turn it out quick. There's a car coming. Okay. So much noise. You want to dig? I'll hold the light. Wait. What's the matter? Shut up. I thought I heard somebody. Go on, dig. Uh, pick up the bricks. Okay. Let me hold the light and you can both dig. We'll get out of here quicker. Okay. Don't do that, Stanley. <laughs> uh, nobody gonna hurt you, kid. Nobody. Here, come back with that light. Come on, let's stop kidding around. I'm going to sit down. You'll get all wet. No, there's an old busted chair here. Oh, for the love of... All right, all right. There. Yeah, now let's go. <gasps> now what's the matter? Stanley, you didn't sit in this chair, did you? You kidding? Pete? What's the matter? Somebody's been sitting in it. The seat's still warm. And she dropped the flashlight. And it rolled down into the hole we'd been digging. The light went bouncing down and down and down and down. Hundreds of feet we could watch it. Twisting and turning and lighting up the sides of a deep, smooth shaft that seemed to have no bottom at all. And there we were in the dark down in Beezer's cellar. The darkness pushing down on us. There was a sound somewhere, way far off, that seemed to come up to us from the bottomless pit we had opened. And I swore. I lit a match. Pete and Marlena were leaning over the edge of the hole. Marlena jumped back and she started screaming. And she wouldn't stop till I slapped her face a couple of times. I said, cut it out. Do you want all the cops in the state to come running? She grabbed me by the arm. She was yammering like a baby. She passed out cold. Only the quick grab the peep made kept her from falling right down the hole. Well, Pete and I slapped some of the dirty water in her face. And pretty soon she sat up. She started to cry. And it started to rain. Look, Pete said. Look. 
I don't go for this, Stanley. Scared of ghosts. Oh, nuts. There's no ghosts, but I think we can find a better place to bury our dough than Mr. Beezer's cellar. Let's get out of here, please. Let's get out of now, here. Cut it out, Marlene. No, no, let's get out of here. I tell you, I know. You saw a reflection of the match down this old well. Well? Sure, that's what it is. It's a well. <laughs> Some of these old houses had a well right in the cellar. I, I remember it from when I was a kid. And we busted into the well. I saw eyes looking at me. Got it out. You didn't either. We'd have been in a swell fix if we dropped a suitcase down the well. Yeah, I'll say we would. Yeah, let's dig another hole. Shut up, Marlena. Let's get out of this. I'm getting soaked. Yes, let's get out of here, Stanley. Go on, you two, if you want. I'm going to get this suitcase planted. Come on, Pete. Yeah. Hurry up, Stanley. I'll hurry. Wish you hadn't dropped that light. Pete, this time we can. All right, all right. Cut it out. Hurry. Don't make so much noise. something, Stanley? Huh? Uh, you know what? Something's happened. What are you whispering about? Listen, Stanley, I, I've been all around the walls of this place, and that busted place in the walls where we came down ain't there anymore. What are you? Well, I'm telling you, Stanley. Light a match and look for yourself. And I struck a match, and I shielded it carefully in my hands. And I looked around the walls of Beezer's cellar in the drizzling rain. And you know what? There wasn't any way out of that place that I could see. The walls, all four of them, was as smooth as glass. And from way, way down deep in the earth, I could just see a little bitty gleam from that flashlight. I thought to myself, I... You see what Marlena meant? It, it does look like eyes now, don't it? at the bottom of a musty old cellar in the middle of the night and a hole in the floor that goes down I haven't got any idea how far and rain and a hysterical woman and a suitcase with $82,000 and no way to get out of the place great huh well you can explain anything can't you a hole in the floor sure that was a well the eyes she thought she saw sure that was a flashlight reflecting on the water down there in the way we couldn't get out. Well, maybe the wall wasn't as busted down as I thought it was when we got into the place. Maybe we didn't notice how smooth the walls was. Yeah, sure. And how are you going to explain that chair seat being warm when Marlene sat down on it? Yeah, that's right, Pete. I didn't want to come here in the first place. Oh, guys, get the life out of me. There's no such thing as ghosts. You pick a swell time to make a statement like that, boy. Well, there ain't. Maybe there is no ghosts. But there are other things. Like what? I don't know. Like things that come up out of the ground. Oh, cut it out. Well, Give me a cigarette, Pete. You're going to sit here all night in the rain? What'll I do? Fly out of here or something? Give me a match. <laughs> Wait, I'll spit for you. Here. Let's get out of here. Wait till morning. We'll find a way out then. I wonder if we could reach the top of the wall if we stood on that chair. Well, I don't know. You wouldn't get me to touch that chair for a million dollars. It was warm. Ah, that don't signify nothing. As to me. What about the suitcase? What? What'd you do with it? I'm sitting on it. Is it warm? Hot as a pistol. Oh, cut it out. <laughs> cut it out. Well, I'm scared. Look, babe, I don't like this any too well either. Just sit 
close to me, Pete. I'm cold. Well, move over this way. Yeah. Don't worry, kids. Yeah, another couple of months, we'll come back and pick up our little prize package here. We'll be warm for life. All of us. If we ever get out of here. Ah, come on. You do that, Pete? No. What was it? I don't know. Stanley. Oh, well, wait a minute, Stanley. I think I know what it was. What? Wait. Stan? What? Come here. Careful now. In the damp darkness, I moved toward the sound of Pete's voice. He stuck my hand and put it on the edge of the hole I dug. See? What? A couple of bricks fell in the hole. Oh. Marlena, get back from the edge. What is this? Move back, honey. Light a match, Stanley. You got him. You like one. All right, stand back a little. And in the light from the match before it fizzled out in the rain, I saw what had made the sound. Two or three bricks had got loose at the edge of the hole I dug and fallen in. And as I looked before the match went out, two more sagged and fell downward into that bottomless pit. Get back, Marlena, I yelled. Pete lit another match. Look out! The crack yawned open, and with a crash, a half a dozen more bricks tumbled into the hole. Below us, I could see the feeble glow of the flashlight way down there. It seemed to me the things crawled far, far below us in that horrible pit. Pete and I dragged Marlena away to the wall. There was a rumble, and the mouth of the pit grew bigger. It seemed that the glow from down there was growing stronger. We sat there, huddled against the slippery walls, frozen cold with terror. Another section of the floor fell in. The whole floor is gone. Come on, we got to get out. Marlena sobbing and Pete and I scrambling at the slippery walls. There wasn't a chance. Then the rumbling stopped for a second. We flattened ourselves against the bricks. In the light that came up from down there, I could see Pete's staring eyes and the tears of fright shining on Marlena's cheeks. I said, we got to get out of here. Help me up the wall, Stanley. Take no use to try, boys. You can't get out. And I looked up. And there, sitting comfortably on the edge of the cellar wall, grinning at us in the light that flowed up from the pit in the cellar floor, was the old man Marlene and I had heard at the roadside restaurant. The old man had told a lurid story about Beezer's cellar. Ain't no use to try. You're stuck. Oh, help, help. Don't hoot the holler, lady. Look, old man, give us a hand, will you? I heard tell of a fella long time ago that got down into this here cellar. Just like you done. Well, give us a hand. The floor is gone. I know. The floor fell in with him, too. Well, help us. He killed a fella down towards Manitou. And he come and hid here in the cellar. Give us a hand out of here. And the same thing happened to him. Never did find his body. More floor falling in, hey? Come on, give us a hand up out of here. Help us. Know what's down there? Fire and destruction. Listen, old man. That boy... You know you hadn't ought to shot that poor feller at the bank up there in Chicago? Uh, Murder's bad. Uh, listen, we got a lot of money down here with us. I know it. You're criminals. Uh, we'll, we'll split it with you. Don't want no part of stolen money, bud. <laughs> Ain't much more left, is there? They'll never find your body. Now listen, you old guy. Now don't call me, Bob. Put that pistol down. That won't do you no good, son. Too bad. Uh, Listen, mister, for for the... uh, Look, there's a woman down here. Yeah. Criminal? Like you too, boy. Uh, But look. Uh, Look out, Marlene. Oh, Stanley. Here, Marlene. Here, Marlene. I kind of figured you were listening to me back there at Saltweather's stand. kind of figured you'd come a-kiting out here to the cellar. <laughs> Mr. Listen to Reason, please just reach down and give us a hand. kind of figured I'd come along and watch and see what had happened to you. 
mighty interested. Oh, if I could get my hands on you. You can't. Not unless I let you. You can't do this to us. We are people. We are. Please, I beg you. No, lady. No use of hollering. The wages of sin is death, I always say. You robbed and you murdered. So you got to be punished, see? You, you can't sit there and watch us die. Another hunk of the floor is going. You better move over to one side. I'm going to get that old nut. Put down your pistol, sonny. I'll get him. I told you to ain't no use. Please, please don't. Get him. Get him. Get him. Listen, Sheriff, I... Uh... I ain't no sheriff. I'm just a feller interested in seeing justice done. I recognized you back there at the restaurant. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, I'll just toll these people here over to the cellar. And we leave things take their course. Uh, look out, Marlene. Oh, Haven't you any pity, man? Not much. Not much for thieves and murderers. He's crazy, Stanley. There's an insane asylum across the river there someplace. He's escaped from there. No, son. I ain't insane. Listen, what would you give to get out of there? You you can have half the money. Ain't much time for bargaining. You give it all to him, Stanley. That's better. You ought to be willing to give up all the money to save your life. Oh, yes, yes, yes. If I was in a fix like that, I'd give anything I got. Well, we won't. Yes, we will. Floor getting hot down there? <laughs> Mighty interesting. Well? All right, you can have all the money. Help us out. I know you don't, Stanley. Hang but... it up. Stanley, how do we know he'll help us? Wait, don't give it to him. Take it. No, 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 no. And Pete leaped at the suitcase I was handing up to the old man. His fingers just touched the edge of the bag when another section of floor gave way right under him. He fell down and down and down and down, twisting and turning into the fire that kept coming higher and higher up the shaft, reaching for us. And the old man took the bag and set it down on the edge of the cellar. See? That might have been you, fella. Or you, lady. Help us out of here. It's good riddance. He was the one that shot the fellas at the bank up in Chicago. Uh, good riddance, I always say. Are you going to help me? Sure, right in the nick of time. Here, grab a hold of my hand, lady. I'm afraid. Get some, lady. Post her, mister. Oh. There you are. Just as right as rain. All right. Now, you... as the strong arms of the old man lifted me up over the lip of the cellar wall. The last section of the floor below us fell away into the fire. And just as if a play or something was over, the flames died down. First they were yellow, then purple, and then they just went out. Marlena grabbed my arm. Where did he go, Stanley? Where did he go? I don't... Hey, old man! Hey! Come on, let's get out of here. Oh. Oh. What's this? Oh. Marlena. What? He didn't take the money. It's right here. And so I picked up the suitcase and Marlena and I hacked our way through all that underbrush back to the road. We were just opening the door to the car to get in, go away from Beezer's cellar. When there was sawed-off shotguns in our faces and lights, I could see the state cop's badge behind the light. He laughed and said, Come on, kids, we're going for a ride. And it's very comfortable here in the little iron room at Stateville. Then I hear that Marlena's all right down there at the women's prison at Dwight. She can stay there for 20 years. Me? Well, I'm going to move. 
They got a tight little room here for people to get mixed up in murders. Little room you can walk into, but you can't walk out. All modern conveniences. Electricity and everything. Well, the old fellow said the wages of sin is death. And I... I guess I'd rather be here than in Beezer's cellar. I really am pretty grateful to the little old fellow. The little old fellow with the six fingers on the hand that pulled me out. The title of today's Quiet Please story is Beezer's Cellar. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper... And the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Lotta Stavisky played Marlena. Warren Stevens was Pete. And the six-fingered old man was Charles Eggleston. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week. Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet Please. Next week I have a story for you called And Jeannie Dreams of Me. And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Now, a listening reminder. Today, David Harding Counter Spy is dedicated to employ the physically handicapped weak. Be sure to tune in. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. That was Beezer's Cellar from Quiet Please here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that is uh, Quiet Please, which, as was said in our intro, one of the finest and most effective programs in the history of radio. It was Joshua's pick this week, and I will tell you, well, there's a lot to talk about, but I... um, good with any episode of quiet please just because i get to listen to the intro <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love the introduction and the piano and the music of that so much and ernest chapel's voice that opening is terrifying <laughs> however you're laughing oh i'm laughing because i was just thinking ernest chapel's voice is like a warm dangerous blanket <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were laughing at what I was about to bring up because in this episode, due to the quality, he says, quiet, please. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like he's then talking to the scratch when he goes, quiet, please, a second time. It's so much more effective when he says, quiet, please, and there's that three seconds of silence. Instead, we had that scratch. And we did warn you in the intro that there was that song quality issue. And I will tell you that I was not warned about the song quality issue. It was just handed to me by Joshua, and I just listened to it. And uh, I heard it for about three seconds, and it was gone in in my head because I was so into the story that it ceased to bug me. And I think that's testimony to everything else that was going on. There are quality issues sound-wise with certain old-time radio shows that bug me because I'm not being enthralled by the rest of it. I didn't even think about it anymore, and I didn't think about it again until it was in our introduction today. But it does go away at certain points, but I really didn't it's hard wait to, on me. It's hard to tell if it goes away or if you just get so absorbed in the story right. that you forget about it. Right. Uh, it might be a little both. Yeah. So, Joshua, you brought up to us that it's been six months since we've done a Quiet Please. What mm-hmm. was it, Forble Board? Uh, whence Came You. Whence Came You. In early October. Wow, is that long ago? Yep. Uh, how many of these exist? I always forget. A I think lot? Like 90 some of oh, them. Oh, really? Actually, it's just, this is good, poor quality uh, <laughs> some compared of them to terrible. most of them. Because a lot of them have that much of a loud scratch, but the volume is much lower. And some of them, you really have a hard time hearing it all. Mm. Um, if you go to quietplease.org, I think it is, um, they have all the episodes, plus they've also transcribed the scripts. So for the very difficult ones, you can sit and listen to it, read along like a little <laughs> kid's book where you <laughs> read along with the story. and they Does it go beep? beep. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> so did you choose this one because of the sound quality or because of the story? Well, I chose this because it's one of the better sound quality episodes. Mm -hmm. There were a handful that I considered bringing because ultimately I would like to do one of the more quirky 
lighthearted mm. quiet please mm-hmm. episodes but um i thought oh eric's gonna really love this one <laughs> <laughs> and i really love it too so i decided to kind of go the opposite end because i think in many ways this is maybe the most traditional horror story that i've heard from quiet please oh really i mean yeah. this is really lights out ish yeah well none of willis cooper's lights out survive but arch obler recorded some of his old scripts later when he took over the show. So you can hear some of Cooper's scripts, Mm -hmm. um, and it seems much more like the Lights Out style. This is really that sort of horror story where there is criminals who've done something bad, and they pay for it in the end. But it's told in this very unique and distinctive Quiet Please style. (laughs) Bonnie and Clyde and Peter. (laughs) 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 <laughs> the little known Peter. <laughs> he is such a master, uh, Mr. Cooper, at the opening of a story to yeah. just hook you, to not feel the need to give you all the information, but just a little bit to make you just lean into those speakers and want to know what happens next. Mm. The opening lines here, uh, when he says, I looked at Marlena, Marlena looked at me when we heard this old guy talking about Beezer's cellar. Get a load of this, Marlena, I said, and she picked up a French fry and ate it very quiet while we listened to the old guy. And mm-hmm. just those few lines, you don't know who these guys are. We don't know who, why they're interested in this old guy, but I can see this diner because they're eavesdropping and the French fries. I know what kind of diner it is. This old man's ordering root beers. It's just interesting how little information he uses to create a really clear picture. He's got that such a particular style for moving in and out of mm-hmm. narrative mode into immediate action mode. Yes. It's a great moment to describe exactly what you both are talking about yeah. in that diner when he leans into the mic and says, You getting all that, Marlene? Yeah. Over the top Over of the, the top old man's of the story. story. Yeah. yeah. It's a really wonderful moment. You getting all this? Because he's essentially it? talking to the listener. Or Marianne. Yeah. yeah really. Marlena. What was Marlena. Yeah. yeah. And so he's really saying, hey, everybody out there, listen. Well, absolutely he is. Yeah, I know. And so it's, it's just such a great way to play with the format. But he's also saying to her, you catching mm-hmm. what I'm thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we still have no idea who these guys are. And then you hear, right. you hear the old man's story and you go, why are they so interested in this? Yeah. I like also... How in this episode, how well in general, quiet please, but how it's written in the sense of that you're not hitting over the head with exposition, Mm -hmm. uh, that you are kind of given exposition in real time. So we listen to this guy and then we head back, and Pete doesn't say, Well, here we are, some people that robbed eighty two thousand yeah. dollars and we're sitting now mm-hmm. in this car like it's not hit over your head you get the information gradually and slowly that's why my notes are all questions for the first two pages of my notes are like <laughs> i wonder what this is i wonder what this is, is this going to be explained am i going to get that and they do and he doesn't feel the need to make a huge deal out of it when he does give you the information right he wa- they walk out of the diner back to the car and he does describe you know pete's sitting there and there's eighty two thousand dollars in the car and he's immediately pointing that gun in our face mm-hmm. and he's really casual about it and then suddenly as the listener i'm like they're <laughs> bank robbers <laughs> you know? right um and there's no organ sting or anything there it, but you instantly know who all these people are you know pete's probably the most dangerous one mm-hmm. maybe but then there's that great line too where pete's like i shot those guys and stanley's like who told you who to shoot and when to shoot them and then you think <laughs> oh maybe stanley's the, mo- mm-hmm. the more dangerous one yeah ernest chapel's not only how these shows are written but his delivery yeah, is really what the hook is for me because the narrative has a reflective tone that's resigned. This is what happened to me, and well, what you gonna do? You know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. yeah, it's always told this happened to me in the past, and now I'm telling this to you in the present. There's no uh, moment of can you believe it or oh, and then this and this. it's just like yeah, this is it's it's a so- tough day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, this happened. I did this. There's consequences, and the the tension is in waiting to learn. Like, what are the consequences? Right. The narrator is always resigned to the end, so the storytelling isn't done in a way to try to ramp up your tension or to get you involved. It's they're already yeah. So it, that happened. It reminds me a lot of incidental music in movies and TV. I hate the incidental music that tells you constantly how to feel, Mm, right? mm -hmm. Instead of letting uh, the story elicit Mm -hmm. these feelings. And as a narrator, he never tells you how to feel. By sitting back and being resigned to the events, you don't take the cues from him. You don't know when something horrible is about to happen in the story. 
you are usually mm. just utterly surprised. Uh, right. You know, it's partly the performance, partly the writing. Like when Marlena gets freaked out by the warm chair in the cellar mm-hmm. and then drops the flashlight and he just calmly says, it dropped hundreds of feet. Yeah. And that's when you learn that they've cracked through to some mm-hmm. bottomless pit. Yeah, there, but there's no panic. There's nothing to indicate in that moment that something really pivotal and fantastical is about to happen. Yeah, and, and it creates, as Tim said, a different type of tension instead of being told to be worried <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah you just have to just snuggle into your warm dangerous blanket and <laughs> see what happens next i do have an issue but i put a question mark that says or was it on purpose mm-hmm. <laughs> there is a significant lack of foley in certain situations that call for foley for example, digging, yeah. digging, it's there and it's loud and it's constant. And I made a list of them. For example, car, uh, turn off the light. There's a car passing. We mm-hmm. don't ever hear the car mm-hmm. I slapped her face. We don't hear that. It's raining on them that entire time. There is, we don't ever mm-hmm. hear the rain, the floor collapsing. There's as sound, it, but it's not, it's not very huge. sparse. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of places where as this floor is continuing to collapse under them, there is no foley to support it. So my question is, there's a part of me that goes, why not? And then another part of me goes, well, I'm not really affected. Uh, I'm still enjoying and uh, having a great time listening to this. I wonder how much of it was intentional. Like, is there a a thought process in this storytelling from Quiet Please that too much Foley, it takes away from the story? Do you know what I mean? I have to think it's intentional Mm -hmm. because they do use Foley. It, It doesn't seem like, oh, we're just being cheap. Right. Um, because when they use it, they, they use it. And then when they don't, they don't. And right. I think it is to add to the sense of disorientation as the listener, as you move from, as Tim spoke of earlier, his ability to move from a uh, summary and narration into scene. And so you're constantly being ping pong back and forth between being in the action as it's happening and in this future uh, space with the narrator who's already experienced all this. But not always. And sometimes with narration, no foley, and sometimes in the moment, no foley. Mm-hmm. In in this case, the effect it had on me, I don't know I would call it intentional or not, was uh, so many times in a horror story, a critique of it is at a certain point in a horror story, it becomes an action story. Um, it's mm-hmm. no longer a mystery. You know what's going on, and you just need to like, kill the monster, run for the monster, whatever. Uh, and if there had been foley of the floor collapsing, it would seem more like an action ending and less horror ending like it did without the sounds. Right. It is two different effects. If you throw the foley in and create more action and more intensity and more or, or realistic, I don't know if that's the right word, but like you're actually there kind of feel to it, creates a certain amount of tension. And just being told it without it also creates, especially by yeah. Chapel, <laughs> yeah. creates a different style of tension. That's why I think it might be intentional, like the carefully picking and choosing when and where and if it's even needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there's something about them digging that was most of the foley in the story, the digging uh, and chopping away the bricks to find a place to bury, that was significant. Yeah, the the quality of that sound was just the hard stone echoing uh, Mm -hmm. this chamber. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah. Here's what I had a hard time picturing. So if you build a house, right, and you build the basement, and then you stop, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this thing doesn't have a roof, right? Yeah. It's just a hole in the ground? Just a hole in the ground. Okay, good. I just want to make sure I got that right. With some bricks. And he hung himself in there? (laughs) (laughs) I was having trouble with that as well. You know, that went right past me. We can assume he just, uh, there was a tree branch that was hanging over the Way to go back and rewrite that. Yes. You're welcome, (laughs) Willis Cooper. (laughs) Got the back of a dead man. <laughs> I I gotta have a a, a few little critical th- like. You sure can have them, it, Tim. You're it's wrong. Just, but... sounded, it, I just could not get the the hermit's cave out of my head with the old man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He was a little hung himself in murders too. <laughs> well, great. Thanks Weird for stories. It for me. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I think I knew that he was coming back and was the guy. But I'm not 100% sure if I made that conscious. When he came back and said, oh, I saw that. Did I see that coming? I don't know. I think there's something about this that is playing with the idea of the obviousness to the listeners and that the criminals are deluding themselves because it's there right from the top. I mean, 
the old man, the hermit, <laughs> gives him the address, right? When mm-hmm. they're listening in, um, he gives him the clue of the six fingers, and that jumps out right away from a horror standpoint that, you know, Cooper's not going to throw in a description like that and never go back to it. Right. It's Um, obvious it's coming back. Yeah. So I think to a certain extent it was intended, but I can also see why it would be a disappointment. It was interesting to me in that it seemed like so many different little subgenres of horror mashed together Hmm. Um, of it's a ghost story. There was elements of pit and the pendulum to me with the the floor falling away. It really mm-hmm. felt like that as they're getting back back against the wall. When there's the subterranean eye looking at them from underneath the the well, that's kind of Lovecraftian weird fiction. It just kind of touches on these moments and goes back and forth, and it's like a a montage, not a montage, a collage. A, that's the word, collage. Thank you. A horror collage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although I think the cellar opening is a more of a biblical with the wages oh, yes. of sin. Like yes. this is supposed that to well. be the mouth of hell has opened up and swallowed them and they have paid for their crime. Yellow fire and then purple and then out. And I'm like, that's got to mean something. With Willis Cooper, you always think, does it mean something more? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it didn't. It was just pretty sounding. Yes. So the geezer is Beezer. <laughs> is yep. that correct? Yes. So he's in the diner and the diner folk aren't like, Hey, look who's back. <laughs> Old hung himself in a cellar guy. Oh, it's a long time ago, right? We're assuming these 60 people years. Did, yep. So, okay, so that's the premise, that they don't remember him, mm-hmm. and he's just shown up to get these folk? I would assume so, but also I think he leaves it ambivalent enough that it has this sense of mystery. Mm-hmm. If he's a ghost, did he just appear to just these evildoers as mm-hmm. a trap? Was anyone in the diner listening to him he's a ghost with eighty two thousand dollars yeah. <laughs> does he, he get the money no he leaves the, bar? the money that's does a, he that's a big oh. plot point because uh stanley and marlena make it out and they go he left the oh that's money. right, that's right. That's and they right. run to the car just clearly he left the money so that they could get nailed for this robbery <laughs> and that because he's a sucker they they weren't the ones who actually murdered the people at the bank and so they weren't right. just devoured by the hell mouth <laughs> in the <laughs> cellar uh, they got to go be electrocuted in the chair well, actually, Marlena just gets 20 years. And he's... Yeah, he's going to the chair because Stanley describes it in a weird way. He says they got a tight little room here for people to get mixed up in murders. A little room you can walk into, but you can't walk out. Oh, right, right, right. All the modern conveniences, electricity. <laughs> right. See, I didn't catch that. I did not either. I no. thought he was just in solitary for the rest of his life. No. Exactly. That's uh, what I thought, too. Which I suppose is the same thing. But... Yeah, but I think when he says electricity and he doesn't come out of it, he means the chair. That's what I thought of. Oh, I thought he had right one away. of those little uh, ovens that you get in a yeah. dorm room where you can heat things You're up. You're right. It, <laughs> it had to be that. What are those things called? <laughs> toaster yeah. ovens? Yeah. yeah. Beezer hung himself from a tree, and he, <laughs> Stanley got a toaster <laughs> oven at the end. We'll You're welcome, that. Willis Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's vote. What do we think? Joshua, you brought it. What do you think? I really enjoy it. It is not a classic of Quiet, Please. I think it stands the test of time. I find it fascinating for the reason I already said, that it is a pretty straightforward, on-the-page, golden age of radio horror story, just Mm -hmm. told with all of Cooper's flourishes. Um, And one thing we didn't even mention is just the extended horror as they're begging for their life oh, in yeah, the yeah. cellar oh, yeah. while... Uh, she is, especially. Yeah, yeah, but they're negotiating with, yeah. with the money and, and just the whole thing that that money becomes a negotiation point that's really interesting, too, because you don't know at that point, you might go, oh, wait, maybe this old man is just making all this up and he's just <laughs> going to take that money. So for all those reasons, I love it. I would say it's very close to a classic. Yeah, I might call it a classic if I didn't know the existence of the other episodes of... <laughs> Quiet, please. It's just, it only is diminished by the existence of its brethren. <laughs> As we all are. Aww. <laughs> yeah, totally. I agree. Totally. Totes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with both of you. Uh, it stands the test of time, and it was fantastic, and it takes a lot to get through a... <laughs> for an entire 30 minutes, and uh, uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. So there, great job, <laughs> Willis. <laughs> I hate that guy. He's just too good. Right? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening again. Tim, 
Hey, please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. There you will find other episodes of this podcast, information about our live shows, as well as ways to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can interact with us in social media. We like that. Uh, you'll also find a link to our Threadless page and buy swag. Yeah, we should put a blanket on there that says warm and dangerous. <laughs> With no other explanation whatsoever. <laughs> you can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast if you are so inclined. You can become a member. There's all sorts of great rewards. Um, you can uh, also get a monthly members only podcast, The Secrets of the Mysterious Old Radio. We're not even sure what's happening with that. <laughs> uh, we haven't recorded the first episode yet. Shh. <laughs> it's about an hour from now. <laughs> also, go to iTunes. Write us a review. Let us know that you uh, really like the podcast. Or take us to task. Just interact with us in some way. You know, don't do that. Huh? <laughs> so fragile. Just go yell at somebody else. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, who's got the next one? You do. Oh, is it? Is it me? <laughs> yes. I should know stuff like that. Yes, that's right. We are going to be doing a listener request. Yay! Yay! Back into the listener uh, vault. I don't know what that means, but... Uh, <laughs> we keep all our listeners in a vault. <laughs> <laughs> so don't make a request. Uh, We'd like no. more oxygen, please. <laughs> Uh, it's coming to us from Will. He requested something from Hall of Fantasy called The Legend of Drago, or maybe The Legend of Lavoca, depending or on... Or maybe The Castle of Lavoca. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole nother mystery. We'll talk about that next time. Until then... Look out! I ain't no sheriff. I'm just a fella interested in seeing justice done. Oh, stories. Weird stories. And murders, too. <laughs> the hermit knows of them all.